Welcome to JLive. I'm Jay Arts, Executive Director of Lowell. See you with you for JLive. Cultural us together to explore and celebrate the diverse world of Jewish culture, art, and creative expression. We're bringing you bite sized conversations with the best area talent. Today, I am so excited to be here with the most amazing chef and wonderful person, James nominated chef Irene Lee of Maymay. All right, so I am enamored by what you're about to show us. Can you start by telling us what you're showing us today? Definitely. So today's demo is really, really simple, and it can it's a technique that you can do with dumplings that you've made yourself or dumplings that you've bought from Maymay or dumplings from Trader Joe's or whatever supermarket you love to go to. So we're going to fry these up in the pan and then create a beautiful crispy crust around it. And we call that technique a snowflake dumpling. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, while the dumplings are starting to toast up, um, can't wait to chat with you, Laura. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about what and who inspires your cooking? Yeah, so my cooking is really inspired by our time um, growing up here in Boston and in Brookline specifically, um, which of course is a super multicultural neighborhood. My family is Chinese American, um, but we grew up eating all kinds of food, um, going out to eat with friends, getting to travel um, back when we could do that. Um, and so our food is really about some of our favorite childhood memories, um, the items that we would get so excited when we saw at the dinner table. It's also about some of our favorite memories of like going out to banquets in Chinatown. Um, and of course, all of the incredible ingredients that are available to us here in the Northeast. So even though, for example, cranberries and maple syrup are not typically found in Chinese cuisine, those are two ingredients that, um, you know, come from this region of the world that you really can't get anywhere else the way you can get them here. And so those also factor into our food a lot. I love it. Um, and I will also note for those of you who don't know, Irene is a favorite at Beyond Bubby's Kitchen every year. The beet borscht that she made a few years ago is still, I think, the lead photo for the event because it's so gorgeous and delicious. Um, so, I, you know, you just said you grew up in Brookline. Yeah, I was just gonna say, tell us about your connection to Jewish culture. Yeah, so of course, growing up in Brookline, um, you know, the, so much of the population is Jewish, and it is pretty awesome to grow up and go to school in a place that is so multicultural. Um, I often tell the story that I switched schools when I was in um, seventh grade, and so I went to double the number of bar and bat mitzvahs um, that I think all of my classmates in either school went to, um, which was pretty amazing. Um, I had a very close friend growing up um, whose family would have us over for Shabbat dinner every Friday night, um, you know, candles and grape juice and the whole nine yards, um, and so I think that Thinking about Chinese culture and Chinese American culture and our, our connections to Jewish culture, um, being around the dinner table with her family is really what it felt like to be around the dinner table with my family, which is to say there's so much going on, but all of the focus is on the people um, and on the food that's actually on the table. I love that. That's like the perfect description of Shabbat to me. That's so beautiful. Um, and I am in awe of how you are such a serious social of social justice is so impressive to me. Tell me about some of the projects. Yeah, so um, since the start of the pandemic, um, obviously, you know, um, racial equity, socioeconomic um, access, um, all of these issues, right, are being brought to the forefront um, of our society. Um, thinking about workers and the different kinds of options that they have right now, thinking about disparities in health outcomes for people, um, it can all get a little bit overwhelming, of course. Um, and so one initiative that actually Jessica Coughlin, um, who is here with us, one initiative that she and I started at the very beginning of the pandemic um, was a GoFundMe, so uh, an online fundraiser to support what we called um, our favorite unsung restaurants. So these are like the mom and pop shops, um, the place at the corner that is kind of your old faithful, maybe it's like a pho place or it's an Indian takeout joint. Um, and, you know, these are the restaurants that we're not getting a ton of sort of play in the press um, since the start of the pandemic. And 
you know, even though we knew that the amount of money we raised, um, which was $10,000 um, that we eventually split across um, over 30 restaurants, I think, um, we knew that that wasn't going to save any of these businesses, but it was really important to us to do something to say, like, we're thinking about you, you're important to us, your businesses matter to us. Um, and, you know, there is like a, a Vietnamese sandwich shop that got me through, uh, you know, probably several years of my life at this point. So making sure that we can have connections to those businesses um, and still be connected to them in this time, even though, you know, they may not have a huge Instagram following, for example, that was really important to us. In addition to that, you know, when we think about hunger and access to food here in Massachusetts, we're really talking about how we match the abundance of Massachusetts, um, which is, you know, in many places, a very wealthy state um, with the need that continues to exist here um, because income and wealth inequality is so great. And so when we were looking at people, you know, waiting in line, to go to the grocery store um, who were lining up outside of, for example, the Chelsea Collaborative um, to get meals from them. We felt like, okay, we have an abundance of food at Mene, um, not because we have so much money, but because we have access to wholesale products and we can actually leverage the wholesale supply chain. And so we started a donor funded initiative along with Tracy Chang from Pagu Restaurant in Cambridge, um, one of my all time favorite restaurants where I got married, of course. Um, and we created uh, this system where we had volunteers um, deliver bags of groceries, very culturally appropriate groceries, you know, rice, beans, um, maseca, onions, garlic, ginger, um, to immigrant families in Everett, um, in Chelsea, and in Cambridge and Somerville. Um, and so that was all donor funded work. We actually moved about 100,000 pounds of food. Um, across the, the several months that we were actively doing that. Um, and the project does live on. Of course, the um, initial swell of funding for this kind of work has kind of tapered off in some ways, but we're always trying to look at, you know, what is it that Mene has extra of? Or what kind of special access do we have and how can we leverage that for everyone else? That's so beautiful. I love that. Should we take a look at the dumplings? Yeah. So we're starting to get a little browning on the bottom, which is exactly what we want. And I should mention these dumplings are fully cooked, um, but even if they were raw, we would be starting in this way as well. And I'm just gonna swirl the pan a little to make sure we get the oil underneath the entire dumpling. And of course, um, another connection I think to Jewish culture and to cultures all over the world is the dumpling. Um, in our dumpling classes, uh, which used to be in person, but now we do virtually, we always say that dumplings make the world go round because every culture has a delicious thing wrapped in a delicious starch and then you steam it or you fry it or you poach it. Um, and it is a, a comfort food kind of no matter where in the world it comes from. So if it is a kreplach or a pierogi or a momo um, or a tortellini, you know, there's something about that that I think is familiar no matter where it comes from. I love it. And when you first told me you wanted to work with dumplings today, I was so excited because I said it couldn't be more perfect in the high holiday season because for me, kreplach are the symbol of Rosh Hashanah. So I promise I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make this snowflake with my kreplach and we'll report back to you all. I can't wait to see it. I hope you'll tag us in your pictures. And so what we're doing right now is just making a little slurry out of all-purpose flour, cornstarch, and water. And I also put a pinch of salt in it because this is what is going to form that delicious, crunchy snowflake. Um, and I like my crunchy snowflakes just a little bit salty, kind of like a, a corn chip or something like that. I'm just going to give this one more stir with my chopsticks, make sure everything's dissolved. And I'm I just hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry watching you. <laughs> so I'm going to protect my phone um, from the potential splatter. But we're putting our snowflake mixture into the bottom of the pan. And I think because I only have five dumplings in there and a big frying pan, we're going to have a huge snowflake, which is actually perfect. That's just how I like it. So as you can see, the um, liquid is sort of starting to cook off from the bottom of the pan. 
and that's also helping to steam the rest of the dumplings. So these dumplings were cold when we started. Now they have a nice browned um, bottom and the rest of the uh, dumpling is going to get steamed by that water that's in there. Cool. All right, so while those are doing their thing, I can also vouch for the dumpling classes that you've been doing at May May. I had the good fortune of taking one a couple of weeks ago and it was so much fun and I made my own dough. It was really a blast. Um, so for all of us out there, can you tell us like, what else are you working on now? Classes and what else? Yeah, so honestly, classes have been, I think, the biggest and most surprising part of this kind of new business model that we have. Um, we have been doing public classes as well as um, corporate classes. Um, so if a company is looking to do kind of a virtual team experience, uh, we have been doing private classes. So for families that like want to get together, maybe people are all over the country. Um, you know, on Mother's Day, we had several classes where uh, you know, kids and grandkids from all over the country and actually the world were, were gathering to make dumplings with their mom on Mother's Day, which I thought was very sweet. Um, and then we have also sort of branched out into other kinds of food. So we have a handmade noodle class. Um, we have a walk and knife skills class that culminates in making um, the most delicious fried rice ever. Um, and we're also working on a tofu class, uh, which I'm really excited about because I think tofu, you know, kind of gets a bad rap. And um, continuing to just listen to what, what people are telling us about how cooking at home is going, um, what skills they are interested in building. And, you know, here at Maine, we, we are YouTube educated cooks. Um, and so I think for us, it's less that we feel like we have expertise, you know, that we can share and more just that we really want to get people together and get everyone excited about food. Um, and so that's one reason why it's so fun to have people of all ages um, and from all different places getting to come together to do these classes with us. That's so cool. I know when I joined on one, there were people from all over the world and it's the craziest thing to be able to all cook together. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. And I think that, you know, even when we can't all be together, um, something about sitting at the table, even if, you know, it's at a computer um, and knowing that you're eating the same food. I think that's just like a tiny little piece of, of connection that is really beautiful. And um, of course, it feels great to eat food that you made yourself. Um, and so that's also something we want to make sure we're instilling in people. We love when people cook at home. Um, I think some restaurants or chefs might kind of feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to share my secret recipe. But for us, like the more people cook at home, the more we know that they appreciate and understand the food. And we actually think that, that we come out on top if that is the case. 100%. And I have to admit to that point, I am also amazed by the trick you taught me when I ordered the um, double awesome kit and you send the eggs sous vide cooked so that you can reheat them at home. It's amazing. It's a cooked egg inside of a shell. You blew my mind. <laughs> yes, that is a super fun trick. And um, well, my table is a little bit crooked. You can tell because the snowflake is thicker on one side than the other, but that's okay gonna roll with it that's what this is all about um yeah so the sous vide egg is is really fun um and the double awesome that's a italian pancake sandwich uh, with two oozy eggs uh cheddar cheese and green pesto um not by any means a traditional chinese dish um but something that my sister came up with um and the kind of thing that she would have invented uh like scrounging in the freezer after school um and so i think that in a way it kind of like sums up what the uh <laughs> and one of my little um uh, Kitchen Elves has brought me one to share with you. Um, and so we Can I grab that? <laughs> the scallion pancake, the eggs, and the green sauce. Um, and we, prior to COVID, had a lot of um, different kinds of scallion pancake sandwiches. But, you know, we've had to simplify a little bit. And the Double Awesome is, is by far our best seller. Um, the one that I think people really can't live without. Um, and so that's the one that we've kept. It's delicious. There's no denying it. <laughs> Okay, so I want to know more about this tofu. You have me intrigued. I've always wanted to know how to make tofu. Yeah, I think that, you know, my sense is that tofu kind of has this um, stereotype about being um, bland and having kind of either a, a boring texture or even an unpleasant texture. Um, and I think that when we start to really learn about the breadth of Chinese cooking that is out there, you learn that 
tofu comes in all different textures and in all different flavors. And actually, it can just really soak up the flavor of whatever you're adding to it. Um, so marinating it, frying it, um, frying it, and then marinating it. There are so many different techniques um, that can go into making tofu. And I also think that, um, you know, of course, tofu is used as a substitute for meat in a lot of cases, which I think is really great. Um, it's nice for us to be able to serve tofu dishes to our vegetarian and vegan guests. Um, and at the same time, uh, tofu in Chinese cooking is often paired with meat. Um, and so it's a texture that can go along with any kind of ingredients um, that picks up the flavor of all kinds of delicious sauces. And so um, the, the working title for the class right now is Tofu 101. Um, and so that is, you know, what we are hoping to kind of do is provide like an intro that gives people some sort of tips and tricks for how to think about cooking tofu um, and then for them to hopefully go off on their own um, and, and make some kind of delicious thing that really suits their palate and, and what they want to eat. That's great. We can't do Beyond Bubby's Kitchen in person this year, but for when it comes back, I think we might have to talk about reimagining something Jewish with tofu. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a great It's perfect for anyone who keeps kosher. All right, are we moving along here? How's it looking? It is looking pretty good. As you can awesome. see, the lake is, is bubbling nicely. Um, and hopefully pretty soon we'll start to see some browning. Um, as you can see, I'm on my, um, you know, uh, portable burner. And so you never know exactly how these are gonna act and how the pans are gonna act. But like I said, we're just gonna go with it. And, you know, no matter what it looks like, it should be a crispy, delicious thing by the end. Um, and that's what really counts. Absolutely. So as long as I'm looking at the dumplings, it reminds me of another question, which is I know um, with this new business piece of making prepackaged dumplings, you guys are thinking about all kinds of interesting flavors. And I love that. It's kind of like how you talk about cranberries not being a Chinese ingredient, but you're infusing them. So what other kind of dumpling flavors are you thinking about and what inspires those? Yeah. So one of our best selling dumplings actually is what we call the pierogi dumpling um, because it does have a um, potato and cheese base. Um, we also have a vegan version, which is what we're cooking here, um, which is made with mushrooms. And mm. in addition to that, um, we do have a cranberry and sage pork dumpling. So that's kind of like pure Thanksgiving, pure fall. Um, we also make a beef and blue cheese dumpling. Um, so, you know, the dumpling is really the, the medium. Um, and of course, anything uh, can be made into a delicious little ball of dough. So we've had a lot of fun thinking about new recipes. Uh, one of my favorites that we're going to bring back, which we haven't really cooked since like 2013 maybe, um, is a sweet potato and goat cheese dumpling. And so I'm really thrilled about the opportunity to, to kind of bring some of these flavors back and really experiment. So if you happen to um, go to, for example, the Belmont Farmer's Market, um, hopefully soon, if you stop by Allendale Farm, and if you um, live anywhere close to Flora's Wine Bar, which is um, sort of freshly opened in West Newton, that's my big brother's shop, um, you can find Nene dumplings there. Um, and so hopefully you'll get to try some of the exciting new flavors that we have coming out. I love it. I'll have to get over to one of them. Oh, we're bubbling. It looks fantastic. Yes, I wish, you know, smell o vision really would um, be the thing here, but if you can hear it bubbling, that's almost, uh, you know, that's, that's almost as good. You Absolutely. We're starting to get a little bit of kind of like lacy flaky crust. Ooh, yeah, you see that? That's delicious. Oh, that looks incredible. <laughs> Okay, so as long as we're waiting for this to finish up, I love that this is a new technique I've never seen before. What are the, is there another technique that you can think of that we should know about, something interesting? Oh, I mean, earlier today, I made one of my favorite um, condiments, which is ginger scallion oil. And the idea with ginger scallion oil is basically you blitz up a bunch of ginger and scallions. You could also use chili peppers or garlic or any like really delicious aromatic um, vegetable or herb. And then you get your oil, um, like a big pot of oil, really, really hot. And then you pour it over those pureed aromatics. Um, and you definitely want to, uh, you know, take a big step back so you don't get a steam bath. Um, and you, uh, you know, when I do it at home, I actually take it out to the porch. 
um, because if you get your oil hot enough, it'll actually caramelize those aromatics um, and really just bring out so much delicious flavor. And then you have this um, lovely sauce um, and a, an oil as well. So you kind of get two products um, out of the one process. And we also salt it um, so that it really keeps forever in the fridge. Um, I've never, you know, finished, I've never not finished the batch. Um, and so I think uh, if you do make a big batch at home, um, you'll, you'll go through it long before um, it would otherwise go bad. So ginger scallion oil, um, but really any kind of infused oil, you can also do it with scraps. Um, so if you have ginger peels, if you have the ends of scallions, um, if you have chili pepper stems, those are all things that actually still have a ton of flavor in them, even though they might not look exactly the way you want them to. Um, and so it's a way to use up your scraps. Um, and, you know, of course, um, in our Chinese household, using every last thing that was edible or that even had some flavor to it, even if it wasn't edible, um, is always a priority. So that's one technique that I really like. And it's so fun to, you know, even make something as simple as like um, a, a couple fried eggs and then open my fridge and be like, wow, I have all these sauces that I can put on them. So I feel like that kind of makes even a, a pretty relaxed weeknight meal um, feel like something a little bit special. Perfect. I love it. My husband and I were just saying a meal is not complete without a sauce. Absolutely. I totally <laughs> don't know that, I think. Um, and I have questions about them. But I think that um, having a, a sort of a, a cabinet or a, a fridge shelf full of sauces is like the, one of the best things ever. Totally. And you know, my other favorite thing, in addition to sauces, is chopsticks. I'm watching you use the chopsticks. I think they are the most underrated tool. Definitely. They can do all kinds of things. And um, especially in, uh, you know, if you're cooking with a lot of hot oil, you can actually um, put your chopstick, if it's wooden, you can put it uh, standing, whoops, standing straight up uh, in the bottom of your pan. And if you start to see bubbles coming up around the side of your chopstick, it means the oil is nice and hot and you can start stir frying stuff in it. So that's a good trick too. Awesome. I'm learning all kinds of good things today. Oh man, it looks so good. <laughs> oh wow, you can see that? All right. Yep. I'm gonna give it just another minute and then I think cool. we'll take what we can that is cooked and delicious golden brown uh, and then we'll plate. It's great. The good news is we're not actually eating it with you. Uh, well, the good news and the bad news. So <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Of course, now we all have to come by dumplings so we can try this. It really is such a nice trick. And um, if, if you do buy dumplings from the freezer section, the grocery store, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but this is uh, a way to kind of finish them and make them look a little bit fancy, um, which, you know, I think the, the semi-homemade um, is, is right up my alley. Definitely can uh, appreciate the value of that. All right. Okay, so as long as we're waiting this other second, I want to ask you one other thing. Yeah. I, I don't know if everyone knows this. You you started May May as a food truck and you've That's since become this fabulous restaurant and you've since evolved. And I, I'm wondering, um, what do you miss most about the food truck? You know, what I miss most about the food truck is that there's no divide between the front of house and the back of house. Um, and so on the one hand, it means there's nowhere to hide, but on the other hand, it also means that you know, if a guest has a question and I'm working on the grill, um, I can just turn around and talk to them. Um, and I think that having that kind of, you know, transparency, that openness, um, you know, of course, having a restaurant is all about creating an environment um, that is like warm and friendly and inviting. And even though with a food truck, you don't have a dining room, um, there's this way that you can actually just talk to people um, that I think is really special. And that's part of why we have an open kitchen at Mene, so that, you know, you can kind of peer over and, and say something to the cook who you see behind the counter. Um, but on the food truck, it's just so immediate. Um, you can look in the window and see everybody who's on there. And, and that's something that I really miss. Yeah. Um, oh, so what, is it the ma magic so, moment? Yes, this is the big reveal. And then we will invert and these are our beautiful snowflake dumplings.
gorgeous. So this is where the dumplings are. You can see by that gorgeous dark brown color. And so that is going to be incredibly crispy. Um, and then let's see if you can hear this. Yeah. So these parts are the most delicious. And you know, when I was a kid, eating dumplings at, at Chinese restaurants. Um, I like to just eat the wrapper, you know, to eat the skin because that was the really delicious crispy part. And sometimes I would just leave the rest. And so with this dish, you actually get um, more of the best part in my opinion. Um, and so I hope that everyone will get a chance to try this at home, whether the dumplings are um, homemade or otherwise. Um, it's just a really fun trick. It takes basically two ingredients. Um, and I think that the wow factor is there for sure. Totally. Irene, this was awesome. Thank you so much for the tips for the conversation. This was so much fun. Um, I would be remiss if I did not let everyone know that our next J Live segments will be October 5th with mosaic artist Audrey Markoff and on October 13th with musician Jacques Pardot. And of course, last but not least, as the tagline, J Arts tagline says, let culture connect us. To make this possible, we rely on generous community support like yours. So please consider making a donation if you like what you're seeing. And um, Irene, thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and may you all have many, many dumplings in your near and immediate future. It's a perfect wish. <laughs> Talk to you soon. All right, take care.